from the wooey, Henry Stern, your state senator. We're back with Beth Burnham from our fire safe councils. Welcome to another episode of surviving the 2020 fire season. Um, new spot, same climate risk. Uh, we're out here in Chatsworth Lake Manor this afternoon. And uh, we're actually at the apartment of my district staffer, Nicholas Gaines. Um, I want to check and see if he's home, but we thought he's living here right on the edge of the fire zone. And we thought we'd knock on his door, see if he's home and maybe take a quick inspection. So Beth, what do you say? I think that's a great idea. Okay, let's do it. Hey, hey. Senator. Uh, Senator, Beth, great to see you both. Nice Thanks for coming. Um, Very natural. You happen to be here? I can't, I can't believe you were home. Who would have thought? Um, I'm actually really glad to see you both. I was just watching the workshop y'all did on Friday down at Malibu Lake, and it got me thinking. We had two fires in two days last week at the hill right behind you, and this neighborhood has been hit by a few fires in the last 50 years, and it's got me worried about how to protect this spot. Uh, you know, I live with a retired senior citizen, and we're just trying to figure out how to best prepare. So, Beth, would love to hear yeah, how you come meet Beth. Uh, and, and take a look. I, I know, you know, you, you, your wife's in Australia, you've got your bachelor pad set up here, you're living on, uh, whatever, state public dollars, so, uh, you know, the money's not amazing, but it's enough to afford this little apartment here, but seeing those fires last week, um, to keep you up at night? I mean, to be honest, yeah. Uh, you know, I do almost all my work remotely as so many other Californians do these days. We have public safety power shutoffs that come and get the power to go out. That affects my ability to do my job, right? Um, not to mention just the health and safety of my neighbors, many of whom rely on medication or they they have a power chair or something. Um, so it does keep me up. Uh, and I'm from back east, so I don't really know. Yeah, so what Nick's, I'm Nick's do about a New it. York kid. We imported him from Harlem and now we've thrown him right into the wooey. <laughs> Beth, can you just walk him through? I know this stuff can make people feel powerless, a little overwhelmed, especially a renter who isn't used to the fire zone. You've been through this so many years before. Uh, what do you see? Quick quick and dirty inspection here in Nick's place. What, what do you see? So it, it is absolutely scary when you all of a sudden you realize there's a fire really nearby, especially when you have some spectacular wildlands right up to your property. Um, and so the first thing that I would tell you to do is when you know there's a fire near you, to sit down and just walk outside and do a quick assessment of what's going on. Is it a windy day? Is the wind driving that fire towards you? Or is the wind pretty quiet? If you're lucky, the wind is quiet. Because 98% of the fires that happen, the wildfires that happen, the fire department puts out. The only ones that become a problem are the ones when the wind is blowing and it's a Santa Ana condition, wind is pushing it's very dry and pushing the air actually towards the ocean opposite our normal airflow so if you walk outside and you get a sense that it's those kind of conditions then you really need to be that's when you really need to go into high 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 worry actually you should probably be worried about it anytime the wind is blowing in that way because those are the fires that get out of control so quickly here what i see is that um the, the, the landscaping is all succulents. They carry a lot of moisture and high water contact with content, which is great. The cactus uh, is the cactus, okay. Yeah, the cactuses, and these are all different various forms of succulents. Well done. The, the problem with them is that they die off underneath, and they're really, really gnarly to work in because they all have thorns and spines and stuff like that. So I'd encourage you to clean out as much of the dry materials as you can because you really want to help those succulents keep their moist, have their moisture, and if a fire comes, you don't want the dry stuff to light on fire here. So as we move closer to you, into your house, um, there's this wood fence, and wood fences are obviously flammable. And you're, fortunately for you, your wood fence doesn't actually connect to your house. But many houses we see the wood fence connects to the house, and from our perspective, or a wood fence, or a yeah, wood fence, from our perspective, it is actually part of the house from a fire behavior point of view. And it could start on fire out here and actually bring the fire to the house. So you would want to make sure that there's not a lot of leaf litter down underneath that wood fence. 
because that's the kind of stuff that the dry, small stuff that the embers will light on fire. Can you treat the wood at all? Better not, not to have. Not even worth trying. Better, better not to have the wood fence there, at all, though, in the ideal. No, you know, Henry, I'm not going to tell you that. If, okay. you, if you have a wood fence that does attach to your house, I would suggest that you have a five foot separation. Maybe go get a metal fence section made. Maybe you have a metal gate mm -hmm. um, so that that's not flammable and that will create okay. enough separation of the if the wood fence does catch on fire gotcha um, so get to the gnarly stuff get down in here get to the make sure side. there's separation and nothing under that wood fence yep and then as you move close into your house um so the house is a stucco house the roof is a is going to be a class a roof it's not going to light on fire doesn't have gutter it has a short gutter system you might want to check every so often and make sure the gutters don't have a lot of leaf litter in them but the house is pretty, pretty much, is pretty good. You just want to make sure that things that can burn that are up against the house, in particular up against windows, are pulled away. That was one of the few things I did know to do, cleaning out the gutters and putting the mesh up there. Yep. So you got your we mesh. Got one the mesh he got the mesh. He paid attention yeah. last week. It's about the mesh, people. That's great. Did you do this knowing that we were coming here? No, actually, I did not. Okay, it's <laughs> very impressive. And the wood bench, Beth, the wood bench, you don't love it. Like, you know something? Leave it there. Enjoy it. But on days when we have a Santa Ana condition, take it and move it over here. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. okay. And, and so, you know, and if you have most of your, you know, like you have lots of pots, they're all ceramic, they're sitting on top of stuff that's not flammable, that's all great. Okay. And I thought you were going to give him a D. I really did. I thought, <laughs> it looks like he's like in the B... Maybe our way. You, know, you, know, you could talk to your landlord about his wood boxes up there, his planter boxes. Well, that it does take that kind but of There's lots and lots of stuff on his deck up there. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that it takes the team to work together. And usually when we're doing these evaluations, we actually come out with two people. So we have two sets of eyes and have a conversation. Gotcha. So thank you for letting me come to your house. Hope Thank I you for coming. And, hope, and hope I get a little bit more comfort. It is very disconcerting. Fire yeah. is uh, overwhelming. I'm glad to hear that we're, we're doing a good job, and that's the biggest thing we have to improve on is just that neighbor to neighbor, you know, community work to make sure that everybody's doing their part to keep us safe. So. Thank you for, for coming out and teaching us a little bit today. Well, and, and speaking of the neighbor to neighbor piece, um, I know we've got Fire Marshal Kate uh, back in the studio who runs the State Fire Safe Council. Uh, Beth is really our specialist here in the North Topanga area into the valley and has been mentoring people to help build fire safe councils. But Fire Marshal Kate, I know you're back in the studio. Um, it can't just be on one renter or one homeowner alone, right? It's going to take a village, so to speak. So what, what are fire safe councils and how do they make communities more resilient? Hey, Senator Stern, it's good to see you again today. Hi, Beth. So before I answer your question, I want to say I brought, um, I brought my new mask. Mm -hmm. It's my new fire yeah. department mask. And I've got a couple set aside for you guys if you want some. So let's talk about fire safe councils. Beth, you know, our, our a home assessor today um, was one of the founders of the Topanga Fire Safe Council uh, down in the Malibu area. We have hundreds of fire safe councils all around the state. The California Fire Safe Council is a statewide nonprofit that helps local fire safe councils get grants. Are we good to go? Yep, helps fire safe councils get grants. We have a fire safe council handbook that helps local um, folks who are ready to begin a fire safe council in your community, um, help you get started. It's easy to download from our website. And we have all sorts of different grant programs of different types, uh, all the way from very tiny grants to help a small community get started to large grants that get extended across a whole county to help set up things like defensible space programs or a new rollout that we're doing this year is 15 trailers that are um, come equipped with equipment to help defensible space in your neighborhood. So those are some of the things that the California Fire Safe Council is doing. And, um, and I'm just gonna go through a couple of um, three slides that we have to share with you. The conversation today that Beth is focused on and that you're focusing on, Senator Stern, 
is really this area right around the house. That zone one, if you can kind of see in the picture, that red area, that zero to five foot around the house, this encompasses your roofing, your clean gutters, the um, patio furniture that you've moved out of the space, the flammable vegetation, especially those flammable plants that are underneath your windows, the area right around um, the base of your house to be clear and clean of flammable materials. That's what we really are trying to get the message around to people. It's the embers and it's the embers collecting at the uh, areas of your roof, the embers around the base of your house, the embers that collect in flammable lawn furniture that then go on to expose your house because they, they create higher heat sources. Extending out from that five foot zone around the house is the 30 foot zone and then your 100 foot zones. But today our message is your house and the area right adjacent to your property. Here's some just some examples of the way that that uh, zero to five foot zone can make a difference. So in the top left picture, that's just a lot of pine needle litter that has gathered at the, at the valley of a roof to a wall extension. And that is going to ignite that wall and burn underneath the shingles and start that house on fire. In the next picture, you can see the rain gutter to the roof edge, the pine needles or the debris that gathers in your roof, uh, excuse me, in your gutter, ignites, it's not a lot of flame, but it burns up under that shingle and starts igniting the plywood sheathing underneath and there goes your house. The right top picture, that's what Beth was speaking about. That is the fence that starts burning, usually from vegetation out somewhere in the landscaped area, but it burns all the way and creates a wick right to your house. Now these two bottom pictures, they're kind of hard to decipher, but you can see you're, you're inside your house at this point. This is a picture taken inside a home that is now being um, intruded by embers. So we're looking on the bottom left picture, we're looking out the end of the attic gable. You're inside the attic, the roof is sloping toward the peak and you can start to see the embers flying in. On the bottom right picture, you're seeing the embers coming in through the tiny little vents. Those are the ones that, um, that our staff member uh, put the screen up for. So he downsized his metal screening on his vents from one quarter inch or greater down to an eighth inch. And if we could move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what the state of the art is on embers. At the very least, Beth has some suggestions on how to get one eighth inch mesh screening and just affix it to your existing um, vents. If that's, it's very cheap. You just go out and get the hardware cloth and you tack it up either inside or outside of your vent. And she can maybe point that out to us. But if you're going for a little bit more um, or you have larger vents, there's a variety of vents out there that are in the market space. You can Google them up with ember resistant vents and they have a different set of solutions, whether it's a special kind of paint that expands and closes off when it's subjected to heat or it's baffled so the embers can't make it all the way through to the inside of your house or um, roof vents that keep the, the embers from coming in based on the drafting through the house. So there's a variety of solutions out there. They're tested, they're certified by the State Fire Marshal's Office of California, and they help prevent homes from igniting through that vent. There's a number of products out there from roofing to vents, windows, et cetera. But today we were just talking about those three. Back over to you, Senator. Thank you, Fire Marshal Kate. Uh, appreciate that insight and for bringing your years of experience uh, as our state fire marshal and now as our sort of community engagement engineer here to try to help people give them some basic tools to get through this fire season. Um, but listen, it's not just on communities to keep themselves safe. And while we appreciate what the fire safe councils are doing, um, it's also on us in government to step up and do our jobs. And we've been working very hard in Sacramento to do that. Um, but I will tell you, it can't be done alone. And I'm so lucky to have one of the smartest people in the entire state of California as my partner in the, in the California State Senate, Senator Allen. He and I have been partnering on a number of fire resiliency and climate action proposals this past year. We've got a lot of unfinished business to do. Um, Senator Allen, can you uh, jump in and just give us a little insight on what things are looking like from a capital perspective uh, as we try to dig our way out of this climate change problem. 
Well, thank you so much, Henry. It's good to, good to see you out there um, doing the doing the inspections. You're you're a you're a all around uh, public servant. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, Kate. And I, I obviously want to acknowledge that tonight is the opening of the World Series. I think the first pitch is in less than an hour. So so go Dodgers. Uh, but um, uh, what we basically want to want to spend a little a couple moments to talk a little bit about. Uh, about what we're doing at the state level, talk a little about some of our unfinished business and some of our successes as well, and, uh, and and just give people an update as to what's happening, and then obviously solicit your support and your feedback and your input into what we could be doing more of. Um, first of all, obviously, uh, during you know, due to the unprecedented nature of the pandemic, the legislature um, scaled back proceedings and focused our efforts on priority issues such as the COVID-19 responses, um, homelessness, housing production, wildlife, wildfire uh, resiliency legislation. Uh, but I will say that Senator Stern um, really, really kept his eye on the prize on this issue. And I want to just thank him for his continual leadership uh, on this. And I, I see him transitioning himself over to another place. But, but, uh, but thank you, Henry, for all of your hard work on, on trying to keep people focused on wildfires. Uh, so we worked very closely together on a climate resiliency bond. This was SB 45. The idea being that there continue to be all of these changes uh, associated with climate change and, and climate change is not waiting patiently for us to develop a vaccine to COVID. Uh, it continues to worsen uh, our, the impact of hurricanes and wildfires. And so we're trying to pull together some funding that almost nearly almost uh, became the, the, the centerpiece for a wildfire resiliency uh, funding package. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get everybody together at the end of session and had to do with inner house tensions and, and other things. Uh, but we continue to be really focused on trying to get uh, some meaningful funding either through bond or through some sort of, uh, of state allocation that will focus on, 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 on wildfire resiliency and also mudslides and droughts and floods and on all the rest. And, and so, uh, you know, Senator Stern and I have been working for a couple of years now on this. We've been talking to a wide array of stakeholders to try to put together a sensible investment strategy. The interesting thing is they, the estimates are that, they're, that, the, that the annual liability associated with climate change to the state of California uh, is gonna start to get into the tens of billions of dollars every year uh, pretty shortly. And so we're, we're, we're trying to see what we can do to, to put, put up some upfront investment to mitigate against some of the, 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 the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, there's a really great player in this space and that's the Chaparral Institute. Um, they're a group that has been working on, on some sort of pro-environment wildfire mitigation uh, efforts and, and trying to help policymakers come up with some good ideas in this space. And they were just featured in the LA Times editorial on this topic. Um, you know, they've argued focusing uh, that, that, um, that, you know, in the end of the day, uh, they've, they've noted that the wildfire program uh, problem that we have is often a, a home ignition issue, much like we're discussing today, all the, all the things that Henry's been looking at and, and Fire Chief Kate. They also argue that uh, focusing entirely on forests and dead trees far from our communities most at risk or, or habitat clearance projects may actually have little value uh, during wind-driven fires. So they, they, they're really warning that, um, that, that in many respects, some of the proposals out there can, uh, you know, in terms, of, in terms of, of, of brush clearance far away from communities will actually just guarantee more of the same, continued catastrophic losses because the, the types of things that some people have put forward have actually not really worked well with the ecosystems of the forest that have burned uh, considerably. You know, fire, uh, for better or for worse, has been part of, of the natural history of California for, you know, since the dawn of time. And so the thought is, how do we work with natural processes to you know, better understand and mitigate against, against fire? So, so what is it that the Chaparral Institute's been talking about? Well, they, they, of course, have been talking about the fact that we need to reduce the flammability of existing communities and we also, and this is something that Henry has been working so hard on, you know, really having tough conversations about whether we should continue to build deeper and deeper into very high fire severity zones. So their recommendations include structural re retrofits to existing homes. So the easiest way, as we've just been talking about, the easiest way that embers can ignite homes is by entering the attic through vent openings. So, so two like really, you know, important structural retrofits that people can can do is. Is is to uh, you know like look basically to, to prevent ember ignition is, is things like ember resistant attic vents, uh, non flammable roofing, those kinds of things. They've also talked a lot about exterior sprinklers. So these obviously work by creating an environment that extinguishes embers that are the primary cause of building ignition. So the sprinklers the sprinklers do this by hydrating potential fuels, 
thus making them a little bit less susceptible to, to ignition. Um, it also you know, increases uh, humidity and it creates a cooler microclimate around the home. These are all kind of obvious things. Water is a, is, you know, doesn't, you know, helps to, you know, uh, you know uh, it's, if, if, uh, if you don't ever see a, a wet, um, you know, lawn of grass light up on fire. So this is all obvious stuff that we all, we've all known for a long, long time. So, so having really good exterior sprinkler systems can certainly help. And then of course, defensible space. Obviously, Fire Chief Kate was just talking about this, but in a study of over uh, over a half million homes, it was found that the most effective vegetation management strategy is to reduce, uh, you know, the, the is basically to reduce the percentage of woody cover up to forty to fifty percent immediately adjacent to the structure, and to ensure that branches and trees don't overhang or touch the structure. Um, you know, there's now there, there's no additional um, structure protection provided by clearing beyond hundred feet, even on steep slopes. And the most important treatment zone ultimately is, 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 is about up to 50 feet. And, and the thing is, that the, what they found is that the amount of cover reduced is as important as the fuel modification distance. So, um, so you know, you don't have to get rid of everything, um, but it, it's, it's about being smart about the way that you do your brush clearance. And we can get you some more information about how to do it in a smart way. Um, they also talk about personal fire suppression systems. So you should always you know, obey evacuation orders, but if it becomes impossible to leave and, or, or if you have the, pro, you know, the, 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 the proper training, the Chaparral Institute recommends a personal home firefighting system that involves an independent water source, an independent water pump and firefighting hoses and equipment. So these are all, you know, really great recommendations for home hardening that we're, we're trying to figure out ways to better incentivize through state policy. But of course, as Henry mentioned, the state has to play a more, more robust role uh, directly. And so what have we been doing? Well, we've got a couple of bills that we've been trying to get across the finish line. So SB 182, this was Senator Jackson's bill that would have reduced the risk of catastrophic wildfire damage to our communities by strengthening local planning requirements and guidelines for permitting development in very high fire hazard areas and directing local governments to develop comprehensive retrofit strategies for, for structures in their communities that are in need of fire hardening. This was ultimately vetoed by the governor. He, he thought that this was going to work against the state's housing goals, but I, I really, and I know, I know Senator Stern agrees with this. We, you know, we certainly believe in the importance of, 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 of more housing, uh, but, but in the end of the day, we really do have to be more deliberate and thoughtful as we push to meet our housing goals. We got to be mindful about not putting Californians in harm's way, both in terms of the homes that they go to live in, but also our firefighters and our, and our, uh, you know, who, who, are, who are basically sent out to protect those homes. Um, Senator Stern, as I mentioned, has been a real leader in this area. He's got two really, really great bills that he's been working on. Um, one of them was SB 1348. It would have it would have called on the on the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection to award grants for vegetation management along roadways and driveways, as well as public education to outreach, you know, re regarding home and community wildfire resistance. And it would have broadened and better defined defensible space requirements. I thought that was a great bill. It. It lost along the way, um, partly because of, of of some some real some problems that happened at the end of session that, that he and I are spending some time trying to trying to work on. He also had a bill SB 474, which would have prohibited development in very high fire hazard areas. I mean, from my perspective, once again, a much needed bill. It would have pushed local officials to prioritize the you know the safety of their constituents over uh, the, the the constant push by certain people who want to just build deeper and deeper into very high fire zones. I don't, you know, once again, this was, this is a very specific type of, of zone. We weren't even talking about high fire zones. We we're talking about very high fire risk zones. Um, unfortunately, it didn't pass uh, in the recently concluded legislative session. And, and from my perspective, we've got to keep pushing in this direction. We got to keep thinking about policies to address building in these very high risk zones. There were a bunch of other bills that address critical issues such as grid modernization, vegetation management, public safety power shutoffs, insurance, um, that continues the whole question of, 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 of grid resiliency and, 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 and just holding our utilities more accountable for, uh, for, for fires. And, and you, you've actually started to see the utilities be much more aggressive about shutoffs, especially up in Northern California, where they've got such a, uh, you know, where they really need to do more to, 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 to micro target their shutoffs, to be honest, because PG&E has done a very poor job of investing in the, in the grid sophistication to allow them to shut off at times when there's high high fire risk, but uh, so there's a lot of conversations going on about that. Um, you know, there's also a, a real robust debate going on between consumer advocates, insurance groups over what areas insurers should be required to cover 
how those costs should be borne by the consumers who are already currently subsidizing these these um, these monumental policy payouts every after every fire. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's a tough conversation as well. I know the insurance commissioners, you know, just promised to, to try to hold insurers accountable for dropping policies and boosting annual premiums by large amounts associated with fire damage. And so there's a lot of issues going on. It's, it's a tough, tough time. Uh, we've really got to start treating this issue with the immediacy and urgency that it, it's been presenting us with in recent years. Uh, you know, Senator Stern and I are, are, are really committed to this. Um, we're, we're, we're willing to take some controversial positions in this area, but we're also really interested in hearing from our constituents and others who've got ideas and thoughts about how to, just how to be smarter. I mean, at the end of the day, we as a society are paying a lot. We are, we are, we are, we are sacrificing a lot because of this current situation. Um, our insurance premiums continue to go up. The amount of public money that goes to fire prevention and fire fighting continues to go up. We continue to risk the lives of our firefighters. And um, you know, it's it's a it's not a good situation. And so we've got to we've got to we've got to come up with some policy solutions that are gonna make it less likely for us to have to continue to spend so much of our treasure and, and quite frankly risk so many lives. Uh, that, that you know, and so so this is this is our task right now. And I know that Senator Stern and I are really committed to to uh, to, to, to 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 addressing and mitigating against a lot of these challenges. So I'll turn it back to you, Henry. And I, you know, you've been being a great friend and partner in this, in this effort. And I appreciate your, your leadership here. Thank you, Ben. Um, as you guys can tell, uh, the man knows what he's talking about. Spent a little time in, in our legal system and uh, trying to figure out really how to, to take all this real life stuff and turn it into law so that it's not just on you to get through these fires, but we can step up for you. Um, we're back now on the outskirts of Nick's house. Um, as you can see, it's got a decent view, uh, but with beauty comes danger. And, uh, as you can see in this open space out here, a lot of hiking trails, um, some DWP property, some parks property, um, and a lot of, a lot of epic, you know, nature, but at the same time, a number of fires have been coming to parts over the year. So we're really right now in the community and state's chief service officer, Josh Friday, talk about what you can do to actually get involved in this fight yourselves, to take on climate change in your own backyard. And Josh, I know this stuff makes people feel powerless often. It's the whole world feels like it's on fire. Um, kind of too much to bear sometimes. What have you guys been doing at Cal Volunteers to, to really empower people with tools to, to take climate action in their own hands? Yeah, I appreciate that, Senator. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you, uh, you as Senator Allen, for your leadership on this issue and protecting not just your communities, but our entire state who is facing these issues. And it's really powerful to be in this backdrop here with those who have been facing fires and facing these issues for so, so long. And so many people do feel powerless. And so many people know now what you guys have known for so long, which is that we're all affected by these issues, whether it's the air or the smoke or the heat. And so what Governor Newsom wanted to do is make sure people knew that they're not just affected by it, but they can actually do something about it. Protect ourselves today, protect our, our, our families, protect our neighbors, protect our communities. So a couple of weeks ago, we launched the country's first statewide climate action corps to call on all Californians to take action on climate and, and empower everybody to be able to protect themselves and their communities. And it's exciting to be here today to say, we want you to go to climateactioncorps.ca.gov and learn how you can get involved and how you can protect your home, doing the simple things that we heard from Beth earlier that the fire safe councils are working on to make sure that your home is hardened and resilient if there is a fire. And we're creating a ton of exciting programs for young people, for retired people, for people of every age to get involved, including a brand new climate action fellowship, where if you sign up to serve for a year or a semester or a summer, we're not only gonna give you a stipend to take climate action and be a climate organizer, but we're gonna give you a scholarship to go to college. And we're creating a network of volunteer organizations like Fire Safe Councils around the whole state where every Californian can get involved. And most importantly, we're hoping to empower people, people that you work with every day to protect, to make sure that they know how they can protect their homes and they can protect their communities. So it's a really exciting effort, but here's the key. 
we need people to sign up. We need people to be part of it. We need people to jump in and take action. So we're asking every Californian to go to climateactioncore.ca.gov. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. No, of course. And, and you talked about the people I work for. Lucky enough to have some of the people I work for with me here today. Uh, Billy's joined us, Birmingham High, class of 2020. And Anthony and Cherokee are also here. Um, and Cherokee, you and your family have lived here, I don't know, well, since before I was born, what did you say, since uh, the 40s? Yeah. 1940s? Yeah. And, and you and Anthony live right down the street? Yes. And tell me, just growing up here, um, I'm sure you saw your fair share of fires? Absolutely. We grew up here. You knew in the middle of the night if the windows were glowing orange that it was time to go. And we really have a resilient community when it comes to acting fast when it comes to a fire. We don't necessarily have a fire plan on paper, but it's definitely word of mouth. We use all the social media groups to engage with each other during a fire. We basically have people in each and every block that we all know each other's phone numbers. Having an escape plan is so important and making sure you know where all your documents are. All your times when that fire is coming through, you don't have but 15 minutes. Yep. And it's really been bred into you in that way growing up here. But, I mean, Anthony, you grew up, you were saying, in Pasadena. Yeah. So, I mean, fire country. Maybe. But now you're out here in Chatsworth Lake, man. Talk a little bit about your journey of coming out. I you guys met selling Christmas trees. Right. Uh, <laughs> those are okay, by the way. We're not going to outlaw the Christmas tree. Let's just be clear here. But um, talk a little bit about your story and how you found yourself here and maybe what you've been doing to, to work on climate from a different perspective. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, after Assembly Bill, uh, the government used the bill, Assembly Bill 2147, right, we started really looking at, you know, the, the collateral consequences and barriers to employment, right, that people that uh, have the conservation camps, we know in the Wolseley Canyon fire, a lot of those people that fought that fire were actually from prisons, and they, they put their lives out on the line for people's properties and people's, you know, uh, the, the land in its own. And so we're looking at the new ordinance that are in place. And I looked at the area and I said, you know, why not give these men and women an opportunity to work in the field? And so we started working on uh, workforce development opportunities within creating uh, mitigation. So it's wildland fuel mitigation. Uh, instead of, you know, necessarily fighting the fires where we had a collateral consequence and a barrier to employment in the fires, we decided that, you know, we let's create the project give these men and women who have the skill sets an opportunity at jobs and working in the community doing wildland fuel mitigation. So we have now connected that with a bill that he wrote, 1339, uh, the microgrid bill, where we can actually partner uh, with all the jurisdictions in the area, LA, uh, DWP, Caltrans, uh, also uh, city and county, and we can go across all the jurisdictions and make sure that we do the, the mitigation, which is the actual fuel reduction. You know, uh, we have a lot of invasive trees, we have invasive plants, we have a lot of things that are catching on fire. A lot of people in the community aren't aware or trained to, to implement those mitigations. And so we, you know, we, we can actually give those men and women an opportunity in a career set at mitigation and assist. And so when you were, I mean, impacted by the criminal justice system early on in your life, did you think to yourself, I'd be standing out here in chats. We're talking about SB 1339 and <laughs> understanding weatherization and mitigation. I mean, actually, you know, no, you, you, you know, I, I think you had to go and, and, you know, we call that a vacation, unfortunately, Yeah. but it gives you an opportunity to learn uh, how to, to network today. I'm here as a pillar in the community, you know, guiding men and women who uh, have given those li their lives and their time to, you know, uh, uh, the conservation camps and prisons and, and in jails and giving them a shot at a career. I think it's huge, man. And I and I got to tell you, I mean, meeting Cherokee when all the lights were off out here in Chatsworth Lake Manor, we literally the lights went off during a PSPS event when we were in the chapel <laughs> down the street. We we're out there with Edison and we're like, don't turn the lights off right. on us again. And then literally it's like, oh, your, your lights are going to be it's shut off. It's going off at 9 o'clock. We're like, it's 845. So, I mean, literally feeling powerless. And then you come in with this entrepreneurial spirit and really try to figure out a way to build our own circuit, to build our own power system out here. I got to tell you, it's, it's awfully inspiring 
Um, and I know that you've been also working on setting up a fire safe council. So I want to talk to you about that in a second. But, but Billy, I mean, I'm not trying to leave you hanging here. You've been doing your own work. I know Anthony and Cherokee have been too, but you've been training yourself, have you not? Yes, I am. Uh, who have you been training with? Well, I am a cadet with the uh, LAFD. I uh, train at Post 106. Um, I pretty much, well, before COVID hit, I would go over there and uh, about once a week and I would train and I have a task book and I get marked off on stuff. But now I, I can't do none of that. And pretty much I just do uh, meal deliveries for the elders with my mom on Thursdays, trying to get my community service hours marked off. But uh, other than that, I'm planning on starting uh, my, my EMT class pretty soon. But uh, So you just graduated. Yes, yeah, class right? of 2020. Which is the COVID class, and it's probably the hardest class. I mean, everyone, everyone has hard to graduate in, but you've been doing your training with the cadets. You've been sort of on your career path, but now you're thinking what happens next. Yeah. And, and, but I mean, growing up here, you saw your share of fires come through the community. Oh yeah. All the time. But uh, matter of fact, uh, I think last week there was a fire right over the hill, you know, the sky gets orange, you know, and I mean, it, it sucks. The air quality is bad, you know, but yeah. But I, I, I mean, Josh, for, for, for folks like Billy or Anthony and Cherokee, I mean, different, different slices of life. You got a student here, you got members of the community here. Does the Climate Action Corps really have resources for both those those kinds of citizens who want to help get involved? Absolutely. Uh, and, and we're very lucky that we have um, three of you here. You guys are honestly the model for who we want to attract to be part of the Climate Action Corps because you're people who have been affected by these issues personally, obviously, in a very intimate way. And you've just decided to empower yourselves to do something about it. And that is, you said it, that's inspiring. And what we want to do is take your story and your life and your experience and share that with every Californian to say, we need more Billies. We need more people stepping up. We want to be cadets. We need more Anthony's who are willing to go back into their community and train others to take your knowledge and use it to apply to save and protect entire neighborhoods. And Cherokee, I want to hear, can we hear about Cher what Cherokee's doing the Fire yeah. Safe Council? Yeah, please. Honestly, Cherokee, will you yeah. share that? It's amazing. Thanks. Well, thanks to you guys, we know about the Fire Safe Council. I know we, you guys have been trying to connect us with Topanga Fire Safe Council for two years. So here we are today. Um, we're connecting with Beth. Hopefully she'll be our mentor, fingers crossed. <laughs> and uh, we had a great conversation with the Fire Safe Council. Anybody watching from different neighborhoods, if you want to get in touch with the Fire Safe Council, Elizabeth is in the chat right now. She put the website on there. It's Cal, uh, Cal, uh, Cal Fire Safe Council. Dot <laughs> org. Dot org. There you go. Sorry, I couldn't really see it there. Um, gotcha. So we had a great conversation with Elizabeth yesterday, and she's really taking us seriously. We've put in the work. We've been volunteering for five decades. So I'd say we are the perfect people to participate in this awareness, um, not only for our community, but for other communities. And uh, she actually has helped us in the beginning process of receiving grants to start up. And with this awesome movement you guys are starting, it's gonna bring knowledge to areas like ours that are really at risk. Because not only us, Kegel Canyon, Twin Lakes, we have so many, uh, Lake LA, we have so many brothers and sisters, especially with the Rural Town Council Association. Um, and that's how I actually found out about a lot of this. Gotcha. And Senator, if I could, uh, the Climate Action Corps is going to be working very closely with fire safe councils across the state. So we're going to be working hand in hand, Cherokee, Great. to not only provide climate action fellows that are going to be working full-time service members, we're going to get a stipend and a, and a scholarship for college, but also working to call on your nep up in the way that you have. Uh, and and that, that's how we're going to protect our state. That is literally how we're going to come together as a community and as a state to make sure that we're all safe. Uh, you three are the examples. So thank you for what you're doing. It's going to be fun to work together. So in other words, somebody like Billy can apply for the Climate Action Corps, become a fellow, and then embed with folks like Cherokee and Anthony and help them basically as their job. Yes. 
their full time job? I mean, how, how does this work? Yeah, it could like, be a full time job, or while you're getting your uh, your EMT school, or while you, or during a summer, we have different levels of fellowships. But that's exactly how it's going to work. And then you're going to organize hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers in the community to go around and do the things that we learned about today to to clear brush, to make sure that fences are safe, to make sure that that people have the right windows if a fire comes. So this is how the how the Climate Action Corps is going to bring the whole community together to step up and really take action in our hands and not leave it to, to somebody else. So uh, it's an exciting opportunity. Thank you for the thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. But most importantly, thank you to you all for stepping up in, in the way that you have. Uh, and we want everyone out there to join Climate Action Corps uh, and, and be like you guys. So, so, I mean, Billy's got to find a way to make a living. Yes. What, what, are, what are we talking about here? I mean, he's he, like, is it minimum wage? How many hours? Talk a little bit about that piece with the nuts and bolts. He wanted to go be a fellow. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to be a fellow, there's different levels. You can sign him here, which is 17 down to if you just wanted to do 100 hours over summer. And there's a prorated stipend about that. And yeah, it's service. So you're not going to become a millionaire. You're not going to, you know, you can matter after your, after your stipend, but you're going to live and we're going to help you go to college with it. But most importantly, you're, the, the skills, I mean, Anthony, talk about the skills that you're going to get if you're out there doing the kind of work that you, that, that, that people in your organization okay. are working. Well, so we actually, you learn how to uh, do complete wildland fuel mitigation. And what that is, is wildfire fuel mitigation. Uh, uh, removal of invasive species. We're going to learn our trails building projects. We're going to learn trails building, invasive species. We would like to also teach them how to fall trees. You become you know, really acquainted with the chainsaw. Also, the other tools like McLeods and, and sickles and so forth. What's a McLeod? A McLeod is a tool that's utilized to, uh, it's almost like a hole in the rain at the same time. So you cut the line and then you can flip it around and pull back. So you don't have to continue to use two tools. It's one tool that does both. And, and so who, who doesn't think that this isn't going to be an important industry moving forward in California, right? right. I mean, those are important skills. Yes. It's not easy work, people. though, I'll tell you that. No, it's no. a vigorous <laughs> job. A vigorous job. But, however, you also learn, you know, about the wildland, the wildlife, and how the birds, in terms of the bird and the nesting and so forth. So there's a lot of things that uh, we teach people uh, to be prepared for, for, this, gotcha. for, for the fire season. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing the birds chirping right now, and it's crazy. I mean, it's like we're living next to nature. We live in this wildness. We're here in the middle of LA though, and yet the fire risk is there. Um, it's something. I mean, you guys, you may not think of it every day, but you're really, you're at the tip of the spear with this climate fight that people all over the country are, um, are in too, and you're not alone. I just appreciate you taking time and, you know, like you were saying, five decades of community members already doing it. We're just gonna try to wrap some infrastructure around it, put some dollars behind it, get some service programs behind it. Thank you to the governor and you, uh, Officer Friday. I mean, Absolutely. truly, we're, we're, we're stoked to have you <laughs> down here in LA in the Wooey, man. It's uh, it's really an honor to, to, to have this program and to help our community. It is uh, something I'm so grateful for. And Senator Allen, so appreciate you partnering with our office. Uh, to Team Allen, too, who stepped up big time and got the word out. And to Nick, who's behind the camera, uh, for uh, letting us invade your apartment and uh, to Jeremy who uh, Jeremy just come on just do one more Jeremy just say hey just a quick book hey. best videographer slash district director slash social media entrepreneur slash firefighter in the whole state of California thank you and to Kathy Letary and Kim and everybody else who uh, helped make this happen Beth we're going to be coming back to you soon with another story from how you can get involved in getting through this 2020 fire season. But for now, I'm just going to wrap it up by saying uh, thank you. Uh, let's stay resilient and let's get through this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah.